So once again, turn to Exodus 19. Uh, God is preparing Israel and Moses, all the Israelites, uh, to receive God's law, the Ten Commandments. All the Israelites are camped at the base of Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb. This is the place where Moses first encountered God. He had been raised in Pharaoh's court for 40 years, and then he struck down an Egyptian, fled for the next 40 years in the land of Midian, which is present-day Saudi Arabia. And there the Lord would meet him at the end of that 40 years at the burning bush. He would uh, have... Moses go back, he would be the spokesman for the Lord, and uh, he would lead the Israelites in that amazing exodus that we saw earlier in the book of Exodus. And um, again, this is an incredible scene that we're looking at here because God is going to descend upon Mount Zion, Mount Zion, Mount Sinai, other things in my brain, and uh, he's going to descend upon Mount Sinai in a very powerful, very dramatic way. But first the Lord will speak to Moses and all the people, and God will give Moses instructions to give to the people in order to prepare them to meet the Lord and prepare their hearts to receive God's word. So let's pick up in chapter 19, verse 9. This is where we got to last week. And it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to it with you, and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Remember what the people said, All that the Lord says we will do. Now notice what that God, when he speaks to Moses from the top of Mount Sinai, it says all the Israelites are going to hear his voice. And God won't need any megaphones. He won't need any you know, amplification, no speakers. He doesn't need a you know, top-notch sound system. But God will speak very clearly, powerfully, and everybody will hear him. But also notice why God is going to speak loudly to Moses so that they would hear God, that they would believe the word of God that Moses would speak to them. This is why pastors need to teach and preach the word of God, so that people would hear the word of the Lord, grow in our faith and trust in the Lord. Now look at verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Interesting. And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of of all the people. So a couple of things to take note of here. First of all, God tells the Jews to consecrate themselves and wash all their clothes. This would be an outward sign of what God was going to do in their lives. They were to consecrate or dedicate themselves for the purpose of hearing God's word, receiving God's word. Now, in the same way, we are to consecrate ourselves. We're to set ourselves apart to hear the word of the Lord. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, through prayer, through quiet time with God, opening up the scriptures. Psalm 119, starting in verse 9, says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. If you and I want to hear the voice of the Lord more clearly, we need to dedicate, consecrate our hearts, our soul, our minds to the Lord. We also need to turn off all the noise of the world around us because there's a lot of stuff going on around us that we don't need to be listening to. Then we can dive into the Word without distraction. Again, that's what God is telling the people of Israel. He's giving them some practical instructions so that they would have ears to hear what God is going to say to them when he comes down in glory and he speaks loudly and clearly. Our chief shepherd, Jesus, he tells us the same thing in John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Again, the primary way we hear His voice is by opening up the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us. As Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now the other thing to take note of here is in verse 11 where He says, Let them be ready for the third day, because on the third day 
an awesome, and I can't even comprehend how glorious event, this event and how amazing it would be, God himself would descend upon Mount Sinai in power and lightning and thunder and so forth, as we'll see in a moment. As followers of Jesus, though, we rem remember something else that happened on the third day. It was very powerful. It was glorious beyond our comprehension. Jesus went to the cross, died on Passover, the final sacrificial lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. He shed his blood for our sins. He was buried in the tomb. But on that third day, he rose up, he conquered the grave, and because he's alive forevermore, he can offer the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will come to him by faith. So prepare for this third day, the Lord says. Look at verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. In other words, you're not going to beat him up if he does this, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. They could come near it, but don't touch it. So here's another important instruction to prepare their hearts to see the Lord. They were to set bounds or boundaries, literally parameters around the base of Mount Sinai, and they were not to cross those boundaries. God had made it very clear, you shall not cross that boundary or you'll be put to death. Never forget, God is holy God is righteous, he is perfect, he's sinless, but mankind, well, we are unholy. We are far from perfect. Uh, we are sinners by nature and by our actions. And we need to be careful not to cross the line of trying to pull God down to our level or try to lift ourselves up to be equal with God. Uh, right now, there's a temple being built. I use that word lightly, facetiously. It's not a temple. It's a pagan place on Horizon Drive, and that's part of what they do. They build these temples. They consecrate themselves. Their goal as a Mormon male is to become a god. They pull God down to their level, or they lift up God to be equal with him. No, we don't lift ourselves up. We don't think that we are gods in the making. There's only one true God, and you are not him. He is the creator, and we are his unique creations. So we should always have a very healthy fear of the Lord. And that's one of the things lacking in our nation, in our churches today. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, A fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, of course, Jesus calls us friends. And He wants us to draw near to Him. He wants us to come close to Him. But we should never lose sight of the fact that He alone is awesome in power and glory. In fact, this is one of the biggest problems in many churches today. We've lost the proper understanding of the fear of God. So, we are living in the days of the Laodicean church. Two churches in Revelation that are the last day's churches, Church of Philadelphia, they kept God's word, they did not deny his name, they kept the faith. God says, I will keep you from the time of testing that's coming on the whole world. That's the Philadelphia church, hopefully you were part of that. The other, part, the other church in the last days is the Laodicean church. They're boastful, they're arrogant, they do their own thing, live their own life, Jesus says of the Laodicean church, Revelation 3, 15 to 17, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, this is the Laodicean church all around us in our nation, I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing. Just name it and claim it. It's all yours. Jesus says, And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. When Paul was speaking of the last day's church, one of the last things he wrote, 2 Timothy, he says this in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 4. He tells Timothy, Preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. It's not all about patting somebody on the back and sending them away with a happy message. Go your way in peace. No, that's not what he's saying. You need to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That's just basic biblical doctrine. They don't endure it anymore. They don't want it anymore. But according to their own desires, Paul says, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Do you know why that happens? It's simply because those churches did not stay within the parameters of God's word. He tells the Israelites, put a border around Mount Sinai. Don't cross these parameters. We've got God's parameters. It's God's word. It's only within the parameters of God's word that we can be confident that we are hearing God's voice. Because once you start listening to everybody else out there and they're misquoting scripture, taking scripture out of context, writing books saying, this is what God told me, or this is Jesus calling, and they misquote the scriptures, that is not God speaking. We're filled in our country with false prophets, false teachers, claiming to be speaking for God, and yet more often than not, their words contradict the Bible. And so be careful. Satan has not changed his tactics. What he said to Adam and Eve in the garden is what he does all the time. What did he say? Has God really said? And then he twists the scripture. God was very clear what he told Adam in the garden. And then he twists the scripture. Here in Exodus, God clearly lays out the parameters for the Israelites. Don't go up to the mountain. Don't even touch its base or you will die. Verse 14, so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes and he said to the people, be ready for the third day. And a little side note, and do not come near your wives. Wow, that's kind of weird. In other words, abstain for a few days. Three days you can go without having relationship with your spouse this was in order to be ceremonially clean. You can look at Leviticus 15, verses 16 and 17. That's what he talks about there, how to be ceremonially clean after you have sexual relationships. So here he says abstain for you know a few days here. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, if you want to hear from God more clearly, pray and fast, which means for a season, put away anything and everything that will preoccupy your mind, that wants to entice your flesh. And that's all God is saying to the Israelites. Abstain for a few days because I'm going to do something powerful and amazing in your presence and I want your full attention. So verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. What an amazing scene this is. I mean, I'm, I can't even comprehend how awesome and spectacular this must have been. Thunderings, lightnings. God coming in a fire, scorching the top of the mountain. The Lord descends. Smoke like a furnace goes up. The entire mountain, it says, shook and quaked greatly. In the natural realm, there's some theologians that try to say, oh, this was a volcanic, volcanic eruption. It's like, if it was a volcanic eruption, Moses and all the Israelites would have been covered in lava <laughs> and ash. This was not a volcanic eruption. In fact, this is a supernatural event that you know was brought on by the Lord. These mountains in Saudi Arabia are not volcanic. They're granite, 
And uh, we've, you've seen pictures, we'll have more later on, but Mount Sinai there in Saudi Arabia, the very top of it and the surrounding hills around it, they're all scorched black. People have gone up there, you dig, flip a rock over, and it's not black. It's just the top that is scorched. Very interesting place. The surface of the mountain was burned. Well, anyway, look at verse 19. It says, And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Again, what a scene this must have been. There's a long, loud trumpet blast. God descends upon the top of the mountain. Moses goes up to meet the Lord. All the people are gathered together around the base of the mountain. Sounds a little bit like the rapture of the church. The Lord descends. We're caught up to be with him, and we'll be with the Lord after the trumpet sounds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. Now this trumpet that Moses hears, it's long, it's loud. I think this trumpet at the rapture, it's going to be quick. I don't even know what it sounds. do 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 boom, we're gone. I mean, whatever that trumpet is, we're just out of here in a flash. It's going to be awesome. It says, And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That word caught up in the Greek is harpazo. That's where we get the word for rapture. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, this trumpet blast in Exodus, it was scary. The people were frightened. I mean, they were terrified of this, but it's a preview of the law of God because the law on its own is very scary because nobody can keep it. It's perfect in every way. The law brings death as we go through the scriptures. This trumpet blast in, uh, for the rapture, it's not going to be scary at all. You won't even have time to be scared. It's going to sound, we're gone, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. And because the rapture is also a picture of the fulfillment of God's grace in a believer's life, because that is when we will receive our eternal resurrection bodies, a body that will never get sick, never get old. You'll never get tired. You'll never have to listen to people grumble and complain because they'll be in their resurrection bodies. Our bodies will never wear out. We cannot die. It's going to be amazing beyond comprehension. Well, look at verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, now you shouldn't be but Moses says to the Lord. You don't ever want to put a but there and then you're going to change or try to change God's mind. You know, it was like, but Lord, I've never. Peter says, no way, Lord, I'll never. And it's like, don't contradict the Lord. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, away. Get down and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. Now remember last time, I think it was last time, one of these times, Moses goes up and down about seven times, Mount Sinai, 80-something years old. And it's 8,500 feet high mountain, Mount Sinai there. So he's going up and down, up and down. He's probably like, okay, Lord, I already told him. No, go down, away. <laughs> so, okay, I'll go back down. So he was in good shape for an old guy. He lived to be 120, so yeah, he was in good shape. Again, an amazing scene. In the book of Hebrews, we see an amazing contrast, and this word stuck in my brain, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Mount Sinai here in Saudi Arabia where the law is given, Mount Zion, where we're going to be gathered to be with the Lord in glory. It's a contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Look at these verses in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 18. It says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice 
of words and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of, oops, I said that, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. We'll see that later on. They're, they're like, okay, stop, no more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Again, a little bit later on. But you have come, this is for the believers, Jews and Gentiles who have put their faith in Christ. You've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. I hope you made your reservation. That you're registered in heaven. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And so what a blessing it is to be under the new covenant. You know, we are under the covenant based on the once and forever sacrifice of Jesus, the shedding of his perfect spotless blood. Whoever touched the Mount Sinai, boom, they were put to death. Whoever comes to Mount Zion, all we will experience is life and joy and peace forevermore. So we're going to look at the next few verses here in a moment. But as we begin to look at the Ten Commandments, we're going to see that this is the heart of God's laws for the people. For us, all the law of God has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who kept the law perfectly. Every jot and tittle. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law, and he did. So we're not looking at these and like, well, I got to do all these things. We're, we're looking at it. Jesus did all these things. He fulfilled the law for us. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But as we'll see, God's law is perfect. It's practical. It's still valid for today. Again, these Ten Commandments are what every civilized society has been built on. And here we are 3,500 years later, and these commandments are still powerful they're still relevant. They're still very important. And it doesn't matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what our teachers' unions say. It doesn't matter what our culture says. It doesn't matter what our college professors say. These Ten Commandments are still God's Word. They're still very powerful. They still have authority. And it's amazing to me that most of the people in our nation they cannot make the connection between the violence, the chaos, the disregard we have for human life, and the moral decline that's all around us. They can't make this connection and the fact that we have mocked God's word, we've kicked God out of most of our society, most of our institutions. We don't want God in our schools. We don't want God in our government. I talk to chaplains all the time who say they don't want God in our military anymore. It's so sad. We just want God out of our nation, out of our government. And so everything is getting worse and worse. And again, it's sad that most Americans cannot make that connection. You throw off God's word, you throw God out of your systems, and then you have the vain philosophies of human beings. And they're corrupt and they're wicked. And they say, oh, we need to tolerate everything around us because that's how wonderful we are. And God looks at them and says, you're wrong. Now, as we look at these Ten Commandments, it's amazing how clear and how simple God made them. But by the time Jesus comes in the scene, the Sadducees, especially the Pharisees, had added so many rules, rituals, and regulations to God's law. No longer were they just holding to the Ten Commandments. They'd come up with 613 commandments. And so when a young Pharisee, who was a lawyer, comes to Jesus and asks him, it says he was testing the Lord, which is the great commandment? In other words, what's, what's the most important out of the 613? That's what he's asking Jesus. So Jesus said to him, this is Matthew 22, starting in verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law 
and the prophets. In other words, the entire law boils down to love God, love others. And you can't do that apart from being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see as we go through the Ten Commandments, the first four are all about loving God. The next six are all about loving your neighbors. And as we begin to look at the Ten Commandments, they speak to both unbelievers as well as to believers. To all of us, we should ask the Lord to show us how these commandments apply to me as a Christian. Lord, is there something you want to say as I go through the Ten Commandments? After all, we all need to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. To an unbeliever, the Ten Commandments should bring conviction of sin, conviction of unrighteousness. They fall short of God's perfect standard, which is the Ten Commandments. So God's law is very, very important. Uh, some of you know who Ray Comfort is. Ray Comfort is a powerful evangelist, and he's a funny guy, but he's very strong in the Lord. And when he goes to people, he'll just do all kinds of street evangelism and all that, and he'll talk to people one-on-one -on -one all the time. And he'll say things like, so do you know the Lord? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Uh, do you know where you're going when you die? Well, I hope I go to heaven. Well, why do you think that? Well, I try to live by the Ten Commandments. And he goes, oh, well, okay. Um, and he goes through the Ten Commandments, and he'll say things like, have you ever stolen anything in your life? Well, you know, I took a candy bar from the store when I was a kid, and, you know, that's no big deal. Well, have you ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart? Well, yeah, who hasn't? And he'll go through the whole list, and then at the end he says, so you're telling me you're a lying, thieving adulterer. <laughs> and so you think you're going to heaven. And they'll be like, oh, I never looked at the Ten Commandments like that. The law is good. This is what Paul says, 1 Timothy 1, 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. You know, we don't save ourselves by trying to keep the law. The law shows us that we fall short of the glory of God. When you go through the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing is Jesus pointing out the fact to these religious people that thought they were justified by keeping the law. Jesus said, no, you're not keeping it. And he'll even say, well, have you ever lusted in your heart? If you have, you've committed adultery. Have you ever had anger in your heart towards a brother without a cause? Well, yeah. Well, you're a murderer. I mean, he lets him know, you have not lived up to the law. In Matthew 5, 48, at the end, he says, Therefore, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard of the law. Who can keep that? Nobody, except for Jesus. Only he lived out the law and fulfilled the law of God perfectly. So when a person places their faith and trust in Christ alone, he then imputes to you, he gives you his very own righteousness. So the Father in heaven looks down on you and he sees you as holy, as righteous. Why? Because you are in yourself? No, because he sees Jesus in your life. You've been made holy and righteous. You've been set apart because of Jesus. That's the only reason. This is what Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, speaking of God the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. On the cross, Jesus became the object of God's wrath for sin. Jesus took upon himself the righteous judgment that we deserve for our sins. Jesus became sin for us. Why do you think he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, the Father is pouring out the judgment we deserve for sinning against the Lord, being sinners. He poured it out on Jesus. And then he says that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Jesus. And so now we are declared righteous because we are in Christ. He paid the price in full. To an unbeliever, the law of God brings to the surface, to the forefront of their minds, their soul, their need for the Savior. And as believers and followers of Christ, the Bible says we now have God's law written in our hearts. And so we're not lawless. We don't just do our own thing. No, we live according to what God has said because the Holy Spirit 
fills us up. And He wants us to love God with all our hearts, love others as ourselves. And so as we go through these commandments, they should resonate within our hearts and minds, and we should say, Lord, you are so good, you are so right, your word is so true, and so, Lord, will you search my heart, will you expose anything in my life that is not pleasing to you, Jesus? I don't want there to be anything that hinders my relationship with you. That's what this should accomplish as we go through the Ten Commandments. We all need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. When Paul wrote 2 Timothy just before he died, he had this in mind. The Old Testament, primarily what we're looking at here. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, when he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Rebuke. For reproof, no. Doctrine, <laughs> I heard somebody say it. In a, anyway, doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's thinking of the Old Testament when he's writing this. New Testament hasn't even been written yet. He's in the process of writing these books. And so, all Scripture, including what we're looking at here, Let's look at chapter 20. We're going to only get through the first three verses, but look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So when God speaks these words, everybody could hear what he was saying. In fact, 40 years later, when Deuteronomy is written, Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land, but at the end of his life, Deuteronomy takes place the last year of Moses' life. He reminds the Israelites this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid of the fire and you did not go up the mountain. But notice what God says here in verse 2. This is the preface before he gives the Ten Commandments. So important. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he reminds them that he's not just the Lord God. I am the Lord your God. That's what he's saying to the Israelites. I am the Lord your God. I created you. I sanctified you. I love you. Uh, you're my special treasure, as he already mentioned. You're my holy nation. I'm the one who rescued you. I'm the one who delivered you from the bondage you were under in Egypt. And it's because I love you and have a special plan for you that I am giving you my law so that you can remain free in me and not be brought into bondage again. His law brought freedom. We look at the law and think, wow, if you're under the law, you're under bondage because of what man did to the law. But God's word brings freedom. Would they rather have God's law and serve the Lord, or would they rather be in Egypt and be slaves under Pharaoh? I think you'd want to be under God's word, under his law. But as is often the case, we all need to be reminded from time to time just how bad things were in our lives before Jesus got a hold of us. Without Jesus, we were all in bondage to Egypt. We were all slaves to sin. None of us were righteous. Real quickly, look at these verses from Romans. Romans 3.10 declares, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we deserve because of our sin and rebellion against God is death, is punishment, is eternal separation from the Lord. But the free gift of God, which is eternal life, is given to us by Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. This is why Jesus would very simply say, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so through his son Jesus, God made it possible for anyone to get saved, but you only find salvation in Jesus. There's no other way, no other name under heaven by which we will be saved. It's Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus declared emphatically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I hear people from time to time say, well, all roads lead to God. And I will say, well, actually, all roads lead to the great white throne. There's only one road that leads to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so the question I have for you, is he your God? Is he the Lord, your God? Not just, is he God? Is he your God? Once again, before God even gives them the first commandment, he reminds them of what he has already done for them. I brought you out of Egypt. I delivered you from bondage. I sent the ten plagues upon Egypt. I parted the Red Sea. I destroyed Pharaoh's army. I've given you manna from heaven, water from the rock, because of who I am and because of all that I have done for you. Well, here's commandment number one. Very simply, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Right after God declares, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, you shall have no other gods before me. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. You shall have no other gods before me. And God is simply saying, I am the one true living God. He alone created the heavens and the earth. He is not like the pagan gods of Egypt that they worshipped. And by the way, remember the ten plagues that God sent upon Egypt. Every one of those plagues attacked an Egyptian god, destroying that Egyptian god. God systematically wiped out their gods. All other gods that the pagan world around us worship, they're not even real. They're figments of people's imagination. Satan is called the god of this world, and he has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving by putting all these other gods out there for people to try and worship. But they're idols made with hands. They are meaningless, they are powerless in the presence of Yahweh. When I go to India and you see some of these Hindu temples, it is just gross. I mean, they're disgusting, all the idols they have. I mean, how many they got? Like a million? It's like a million gods they worship? Huh? 33 million? Oh, yeah. Okay. 30, how do you even come up with 33 million gods? I mean, it just blows my mind. But they're all lies from Satan. So God emphatically says, you shall have no other gods before me. And it doesn't mean like, okay, I'm first and these other ones come after. No, it means no other gods in my presence. You shall have no other gods in my presence. In other words, God is saying, I better not see any other gods in your life. So don't think of this first commandment as saying, it's okay to have a lot of other gods, just make sure I'm number one. No, God doesn't want any other gods in his presence or in our lives. Now all the other gods that these nations around Israel worshipped, pagan gods, that's what we call them, idols, Baal, Baal, Baal worship was everywhere in the Middle East back then. He was the god of power. He was especially the god over the weather. They would have Ashtoreth. She was a female goddess of fertility and sexuality. So they would do all these horrible, wicked, sinful things trying to appease that goddess. Mammon was a god of money and pleasure. Molech was a god of practicality and blessing. And by the way, Molech was the god they sacrificed their firstborn to, They'd put them in the wall. They would destroy their firstborn, thinking, that will give me pleasure in life. If I sacrifice my child to Molech, I'll be blessed by that God. People are still sacrificing to Molech today. Many, many gods throughout the world, but they were all, and they are presently all, demonic. Satan was behind it all, and so that's why the only... One true God says, you shall have none of them, no other gods in my presence or in your lives. They're all imaginary. 
Of course, for a polytheistic culture that believes in many gods, it's not a stretch for them to say, you know what? We see the value of worshiping the God of the Hebrews. We'll just add him to our mix. And that's what a lot of people have done. They do that with Jesus. Oh, I see the value of believing in Jesus. I'll just kind of put Jesus in my pocket and I'll pull him out from time to time when I need him. That's not how you treat the Lord. That's not what God is saying. When I look at your life, there better not be any other gods that you are bowing down to. If you are, you need to stop. You need to get rid of them. And even in our nation, that is supposedly a monotheistic culture, we have most of this country worshiping Ashtoreth. Look at the pornography industry. Mammon. Look at all the greed that's out there. Baal. <laughs> oh, the gods of the Denver Broncos are shining down on them today. You ever heard sports announcers say stuff like that? I'm like, oh, shut up. You know, it's so stupid. They're worshiping Molech. They pursue wealth. They pursue pleasure, power. Even if they have to sacrifice their marriages to obtain it, even if they have to sacrifice their families to obtain it. Listen, an idol or a god can be just about anything. Whatever is the driving force in a person's life, whatever the master passion is in your life, that is your God. And if you're not consumed with, if you're not trusting in Jesus, if you're not looking to Jesus, if you're not living for Him, then you have another God in the presence or before the one true God. Who we obey is who we worship. Very simple. And Satan is always trying to tempt us to worship and obey him. But he is such a liar. In fact, listen to these words when he's tempting Jesus. This is in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 5. This is exactly how Satan tempted Jesus. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, Okay, listen, this is Satan talking to Jesus, co-creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. Satan says, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. How is that possible? How has Satan got all this authority to give Jesus the entire world, the kingdoms of this world, because at the garden, when Adam and Eve, they were given dominion over this planet. And when they sinned and rebelled against God, it's like they turned the title deed over to Satan. But then when you get the book of Revelation, Jesus takes the scroll out of the Father's right hand, and he's going to reclaim this world back to the Father once again. So G Satan here is saying, hey, this is mine. Jesus didn't dispute it. And then he says in verse 7, Therefore, if you, you, Jesus, if you will worship me before me, all will be yours. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. Just bow down to me, Jesus, and I'll give this world to you. Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So with commandment number one, we have to pause. We have to ask the Lord, show me if there's anything, Lord, in my life that is a hindrance, anything that is getting in the way of my relationship with you. Lord, help me to get rid of any idols that I've collected in my heart, things that are getting in the way of my intimacy with you. It's like David prays in Psalm, I think it's 138, 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's a wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Humble yourself before the Lord. You want a closer walk with Jesus? Put away anything that is a distraction. So that's commandment number one. But it's a biggie. No other gods before the one true God. No other gods in His presence. Soon every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father.